Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Today we're going to be talking about the goings on in the second part of week 8 in the Ramesh Sunny Balwani Theranos trial. Oh, and a little sneak preview on who's appearing in week 9 already. As a reminder, Balwani is in court accused of multiple instances of fraud against doctors, patients and investors in connection with his role as COO of Theranos. So last week I signed off with a discussion over the testimony of Lisa Peterson, who's a finance and wealth manager for the DeVos family, and specifically the RDV Corporation. In a nutshell, we heard that she'd been sent unrealistic forecasts by Theranos, which were put together by Balwani and Holmes. We heard that she'd been given the Roger Parloff Fortune magazine article that we now know contained a number of inaccuracies. And she was also sent a validation report purporting to come from Pfizer that we now know had been doctored. And finally, she told the court that she was not aware of the relationship between Balwani and Holmes. Four pieces of fairly damning evidence for an afternoon's testimony, don't you think? Anyway, the defence took their turn to cross-examine Lisa after that, and they made a couple of points to offset the prosecution. First of all, they established that Lisa had done some internal calculations and forecasts for the DeVos family, and these showed a five times return expected after five years, and she accepted that these were internal to RDV Corp. In other words, they were not just relying on the numbers Theranos gave them. Also, she said that the DeVos family had committed to invest $100 million before Lisa made her internal due diligence report. Now, apparently they'd originally decided to invest $50 million, but decided to make it $100 million during a discussion in the garage parking lot. Now, the problem I have in garages is whether I've got enough change to pay for the parking time. I guess maybe the DeVos family looked into their wallets and thought, oh yes, oh, a spare $50 million. that should cover it. Under redirect, Lisa said that the statements in the material she were given was in the present tense. In other words, Theranos were purporting that the tech worked at the time and was not just aspirational in nature. We then had former lab director Sunil Delwan. He also appeared in the Holmes trial and you can see his testimony here. Now we heard that he started after Rosendorf left in November 2014. Now was he a suitably qualified lab director? Well, apparently he was Balwani's dermatologist when Theranos hired him. Now, he was hired on a part-time basis for about $5,000 per month and reported directly to Balwani. Now, he ended up staying for about eight months and in the whole of that time only did a few hours work. It was minimal. I was waiting for asking them to do things and I was not asked, he said. Well, I guess to me you can see just how seriously Balwani took the role of running patients' blood tests under his remit, can't you? Now, Balwani did apparently attend at the start of the 2015 CMS lab inspection, but didn't really participate in it. He also said he didn't know that Theranos was collecting samples in Pennsylvania. He also didn't know that Theranos had another part-time lab director at the time, Dr. Lynette Sawyer. Well, he didn't really know a lot, did he? Anyway, apparently he was sanctioned by the CMS after their audit. Well, too right they did. Anyway, the judge held back on whether this could actually go in front of the jury. Now, you could say up until now that his testimony was somewhat reflective of his own dereliction of duties, but we did hear that Balwani called him into Theranos in around August 2015, when he was given the task of signing validation reports. Apparently those were brought into him in batches of 50 and he just went through the motions of signing them all. Now it sounds to me like someone was shutting the stable door after the horse had bolted. Or in this case, covering up for inadequate lab practices to date. Well, you can guess who that's directed at, can't you? Now after this, we had a brand new investor representative. This was Patrick Mendenhall, the CEO of investment firm US Capital Advisors, LLC. And his company had invested in Theranos in 2005 and 2013. And Sonny Balwani was his primary contact. He said after his first investment, which I understand was around $50,000, he hadn't actually heard anything from the company for about seven years and he'd already written it off. However, he then saw a press article about Theranos and decided to invest more. I think quite revealingly, Mendenhall had written a memo to his partners, apparently after a 45-minute call with Balwani, and Balwani had told him, in quotes, The science behind Theranos is complete, and no new science is needed. No new invention is needed. Balwani was concise and confident, he said. 
Balwani never told him that Theranos were using third-party devices and he made the point that this would have caused lots more questions had he known, he said. His firm invested $1.3 million in January 2014 and after signing an NDA, that's a non-disclosure agreement, he asked Balwani for financial information, but Balwani never responded. Again, in May 2014, he asked for a high-level update. Again, Balwani never responded, but Balwani did send the memo to Elizabeth Holmes. Finally, he followed up with some questions in December 2014, because there were rumours that the tests in Walgreens were actually being shipped. Now, just to put some background to this, the whole idea of the Walgreens implementation was that the tests would be run on the Edison devices at Walgreens, and then these would electronically communicate with the Theranos database, and this and the lab techs at Theranos would analyse and provide the test reports. Now, clearly, if the tests were shipping, then something wasn't working as expected with the tech. We obviously all now know they never worked as described anyway. On cross-examination, there were a couple of points gone through. Firstly, as a private company, there was actually no requirement for Theranos to send financial data to third parties, so nothing was actually wrong with that. Cooper Smith for the defence tried to get Mendenhall to agree he knew the tech needed refinement, but he was adamant that he'd been led to believe it was all fully developed. And then finally, on redirection, we had in court the elephant in the room. What impact would it have had if he knew that Balwani and Holmes were dating? He responded very clearly, it would have impacted his investment decision. To let us have full view, because there's always potential conflicts when the two leaders of the firm are involved. So that wraps things up with Mendenhall, and then we had a familiar face, Brian Talbot, another investor. Now, Brian was a VP of the investment company Hall Group, and in the Holmes trial, we heard an investor call, which was recorded, in which Holmes made a number of claims convincing them to make an investment in Theranos, or to make a second investment, as it happened. Through a company called Black Diamond Ventures, they'd actually made an investment of 4.9 million directly in December 2013. Now, in the recording that we heard in the Holmes trial, she'd made the claim that Theranos had the ability to run any combination of lab tests on a tiny finger prick of blood, and large tubes of blood traditionally taken from a venous draw were not needed with the Theranos technology. She also claimed that Theranos were doing work in the Middle East with the military, working with the US Special Operations Command. Now, why do I mention this? It was because there was a debate held away from the jury in which the admissibility of that recording was discussed. Now, it was the prosecution who brought it up in the Holmes case, so what's different here? Well, because it was Holmes' own assertions, what the government are worried about is that Balwani can make the point that he thought that the technology worked because here is somebody who ran the company, i.e. Holmes, and who made these assertions so he could rely on that. Clearly something that would benefit the defence. Anyway, the judge ruled that it couldn't be brought into evidence unless the government brought it into evidence first. I don't think we'll hear it. Now, going back to the earlier investments that Black Diamond Ventures made, they had materials showing that the company would be profitable by 2006 and then conduct an IPO in 2008, which would value it at that time at around a billion dollars. Now, we know that the company's valuation actually got to around nine billion dollars at one point, and needless to say, none of the forecasts ever came to fruition. So, wheels within wheels, we heard from Tolbert that Chris Lucas introduced the Hall Group to Theranos and he was paid a $125,000 commission as a result. Now, Chris Lucas is the nephew of Donald Lucas, who at one point was chairman of Theranos Directors and an earlier investor in the company. Tellingly, this involvement factored into Hall Group's decision to invest, said Tolbert. Thanks for bearing with me. That has now caught us up on the goings-on in court during week 8. This week, week 9, we've already had a scientist speak about the validation report that had the doctored Pfizer logo added to it and that Holmes in her trial admitted to doing. She wished she'd done it differently, she said in her trial. Well, you bet she did. There's an expectation we may hear from some patients too this week and if you watch out for my week 9 update, you'll catch whoever does turn up. And if you don't want to miss out, then please subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell, and you'll get informed when it's published. Bye for now.